Um, uh, corporate governance is a wide area, is the way I see it. Uh, it goes from the firm level, uh, Irish, you know, company law in a country, even down to the memorandum and articles of association of a company, the company's own rules and how it behaves. This stuff about corporate social responsibility, all that kind of stuff is, is, is corporate governance. Um, then you, you move out to, uh, as I say, com company law in Ireland, our law is very like British law. It's uh, shareholder value, stakeholders don't matter in actual practice. Most firms do consider their stakeholders and consider them quite well. You probably know of the debate about shareholder value. Jack Welsh, the famous head of GE, who was the apostle and the father of it, eventually called it Buncombe. Uh, and it, the whole, I think personally, that a key reason for the collapse of the whole world economy is that markets were so free that the guys running the companies, the guys with the CFO, the COO, and the CEO, um, and there's a good song about that, um, they wrote the rules and they changed the rules to have shareholder value. If we're delivering to the shareholders, we get tons of money. And as you know, they paid themselves mainly through stock options, enormous sums of money. And uh, that hasn't really been changed, in my view, uh, in, in recent years. Um, at international level, there's greater cooperation um, between states now. And, and you heard from uh, what one of the contributors, or maybe it was in, a, in, a, in a, one of these side things, that there is good cooperation at European level on uh, you know, and oh yeah, also in America there's been progress on the Financial Regulation Act and stuff like that to enforce governance and states are talking. But it's very hard. The, the rulers are always behind the market and also sometimes they can overreact, I think, uh, believe it or not, coming from the left, and put a sort of a bureaucratic hold on companies. And during the boom years, you heard that when Enron failed in the States and they brought in whatever the act was, I, I can't remember now, a lot of people said that it was overly restrictive. Uh, and of course, it, it probably wasn't. But anyway, so it's a wide, wide area. And, you know, we can hear the speakers on it. So we'll start with, um, uh, well, first, uh, who wants to speak first? Okay, da uh, Damien Tobin, who is an, uh, from London University, he lectures in this area, so he knows more than anyone, except perhaps Ray Kinsler when we find him. And uh, he also has a, a big interest in international issues in the Chinese economy, which is an interesting area. And uh, But corporate, corporate governance and regulation are his areas, so over to you, Damien. Uh, thank you. I should probably start by saying that, in a way, I'm, I'm a little bit of an outsider when it comes to this, because most of my experience is actually with Hong Kong and with China. I've spent most of my career looking at this. But, so a lot of what I'm going to say is, is probably more applies, I'm going to try apply it to the Irish environment, and feel free to criticise me from that point. Um, the the first, the key question that I think has been ignored regarding corporate governance in this whole debate is nobody has asked to what extent is the system of governance dysfunctional. We've poured a lot of money into NAMA, an incredible amount of money. Um, I take the opposite view to a lot of people. I think that NAMA can work because asset management companies in themselves are not unusual, but it can only work if the system of governance functions adequately. And I think this is where it really falls down. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the crisis and about banking. Um, the key assumption underpinning the crisis seems to be that, well, it was unavoidable, it was caused by pro-cyclical policies and international events outside the control of the state. Um, it's a wonderful explanation because Governments can simply absolve themselves of all policy responsibility. You can throw corporate governance out the window and you can say, well, it doesn't matter. It's all to do with international events. And we were misled by the banks, and that's it. Um, the implication, of course, is this, is that you really narrow the available solutions that you can use to tackle the crisis. 
And that's in a way what's happened in Ireland is that the sole means to improving corporate reputation has focused on austerity. If we implement austerity, we improve our reputation. And it says nothing about corporate practices, it says nothing about the value of um, principles in business. It completely ignores all of these areas. So the ultimate danger is that we end up designing a set of solutions that are based on a system of governance that is dysfunctional at its heart. Um, I want to go on in a way to tackle some of these assumptions and how they relate to the system of governance. The first one is that banking crises are unavoidable. Um, this is a sort of assumption that we must tolerate a level of risk in regulation. Okay? Um, and people would argue that the record of the Anglo-Saxon system of governance bears this out, that for the last 30 years it has been the most superior system in the world at taking people out of poverty, at raising the incomes, etc., etc. Um, and this, in a way, has reinforced its legitimacy. But behind that, um, it has also seen since the 1970s, as we said this morning, an increase in banking crisis, an increase in financial crisis. And following each crisis, you have these attempts to improve the systematic safeguards underpinning the system without actually main, making any changes to the system itself. So we've continually placed the emphasis on making sort of systematic safeguards in the system stronger by ignoring the sort of potential that individual companies, individual banks can do to the system at the micro level if we don't regulate them. And I think this was brought home in the, in the, Irish, in the Irish system. I read the, sort of, um, the testimony of um, some officials from the, the Department of Finance to the Public Accounts Committee. And they said, well, at the time of the banking crisis, we were certainly concerned in the midst of the crisis that we did not have a sufficient understanding of the detailed workings of each bank. I mean, from a corporate governance pers perspective, that is absurd. All that information is there on the balance sheets. This, the central bank had it. They wrote about it in their financial stability reports. It's all there. So from a governance perspective, it doesn't wash. Um, the second one is sort of this idea of events outside the control of the state um, to dictate what happens. And this is based on the assumption that in a small open economy, you can do little to regulate international capital flows. Um, this is extremely problematic in the sense that it indicates an implicit acknowledgement on the behalf of governments that rules and principles of good business simply aren't valid. Um, Unfortunately, economic history demonstrates the opposite. Economic history tends to demonstrate, and corporate governance as well, that when you get rid of principles of good business, when you discard <coughs> them in favour of some other ideology, standards go down the drain. Standards drop. That's it. Um, <coughs> third excuse, which was that, well, we act on the, acted on the best available advice at the time. But this raises a very crucial question, what advice were you acting on? Because the advice needed by investors, which are one constituent of corporate governance, differ totally from the advice needed on the regulatory side. And from what I've read, it seems that regulators were looking at the market side. So instead of looking for outliers or dangers within the system, they were looking at systematic indicators of good governance. In other words, the system checked all the boxes and everything was okay. The consequences of this were particularly severe in the Irish banking sector. And if we start with the fundamental governance question of in whose interest are banks being run, and you only have to go back a few years to look at the case of overcharging. Okay? I mean, if you ask who does overcharging benefit, it benefits shareholders. If you don't crack down on it, it continues to benefit shareholders. So the view of the regulatory system seemed to be that this type of behavior was not dangerous enough to endanger the system. And when banks expanded their loan books well beyond their core deposit it's funding, Both the ratings agencies and regulators assumed that this was some sort of natural expansion of the funding basis. 
and everybody agreed it was a good thing. Um, this was partly on the assumption that since the banks ticked all the boxes in terms of their governance structures and liquidity ratios, that they were fine. There was no danger. Um, it was subsequently revealed that a lot of building societies, Irish nationwide, the bypass credit committees, ignored warnings from the central bank. But because, again, they complied with minimum formal governance standards, they were regarded as being fine. Um, the final I mean, implication is that, and this is a recent revelation, that most of, the most of the people serving on the boards of directors did not know what they were supposed to be looking out for. In effect, they weren't bankers. They didn't know about banking. The implications, if, if I can sort of briefly sum up the implications of this for where corporate governance is going, I think the concept of what constitutes the best available advice in the regulatory system has become extremely blurred. And in terms of going forward, we have to be very careful about what type of information as regulators are we looking for and how does it, this differ from what shareholders look for. Um, the second implication is that in a sense the benchmark for good corporate governance practices has increasingly become the extent to which they're legal. Okay? The problem with this, this legal benchmark is that, is that it encourages a sort of regulatory pragmatism where the test of whether something is right or wrong becomes the extent to which it's legal. Okay? And most corporations have huge legal and regulatory departments. We deal on a day-to-day -day basis with regulatory issues and finding ways around them. So this is not really an effective benchmark as regards good corporate behaviour. The third one is that really professionalism in terms of how companies are run has been, has been discarded in favour of managerialism. And what I mean by managerialism is this idea, again, of ticking boxes, and it sort of provides a reassurance in a sort of uncertain world, in a sort of world where banks are becoming increasingly complex. It provides certain reassurance that everything is okay. If you tick the boxes, it's fine. It's almost a fundamental of comply or explain, okay? Um, if I was to sum up the lessons of this, I would say that you know, at the end of the day, it's been proved that rules and principles of good regulation, good business matter in the long run. You can discard them for a while, but the truth is always in the economies that have survived this recession, and they include <coughs> small open economies like Hong Kong. Um, the rules governing the banking sector in these economies are much stricter and much better enforced than we have been able to do to date. I would probably like to say something about China in this regard, and that China is not necessarily a lesson that we should follow. China has sort of adopted a policy of pragmatism over the past 30 years, and it doesn't really give us any concrete lessons as to how we should develop better regulation and better corporate practices. And the Chinese government is acutely aware of the damage that corruption has done to the banking system in China, and are in a sense trying to go back to developing better ethical standards, better moral standards in finance. Um, the second lesson might be that the data needs of bank regulators and shareholders are different. And if I was to give a final one, it might be that, you know, the role of banks in small open economies are very poorly understood. How they create liquid liquidity, how they destroy liquidity, um, we just don't seem to have got our head around that. And there are, again, international, better international examples. And it's not a, it's not a lesson for less regulation. It's a, it's, it's a lesson for more regulation. OK. OK, Damien, thanks a million. Uh, I should <coughs> I have a note here, and I'm trying to remember what it means. But I think it is uh, that Ray Kinsella will be late, and in it has two. Um, so uh, He's touching, yeah. hopefully he will appear. Um, but if he doesn't, we still were well looked after. We're now going from the, the academic to the practitioner, uh, and indeed a worker pr practitioner. Um, the next speaker is Pat Compton, who's on the board of On Posts, and I heard not from Pat, but this morning he's sitting on a lot of money. Uh, they normally have 300 million in the bank, and they have 3 billion. 
telling us there's a flight from uh, the banks into Pat's Cape of the Mall or the talk later. Um, you can buy the pints. Uh, Pat, Pat was also, and uh, that's how I know him, he was chair of the workers' directors group uh, from the semi state bodies, which he chaired uh, very well for some years, and he has been on the executive. Are you still on the executive of the CWU? No, I've seen the light. Yeah. <laughs> Stood down before I was taken out. <laughs> okay, over to you, Pat. Thanks very much, Paul. Well, uh, can I just. Um, start by saying that uh, all this money that's coming into our post is actually state money. The National Treasury Management Agency gets uh, We simply get a handling fee. So, uh, but it is an interesting point that Paul makes, that the reputations of the banks at the moment are so poor that people are putting their money wholesale, and there seems to be a bit of dosh around three billions of fair amount of money, uh, into what they would consider to be safe and, 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 and uh, organizations of good reputation. So I'm, as you can see, I'm taking advantage of Paul's intro there to praise ourselves. <laughs> but anyway, it's not our money. Um, it's the people's money and maybe there's an argument there for uh, maybe the postal service and the state's banking services to be more uh, answerable and amenable to the people and all of that. But it, just in terms of corporate governance, I know nothing about corporate governance except my experience of it. So, I, I will just give you what I think, I uh, will give you my opinion and my experience. And the first point is that I think I wouldn't necessarily agree with the, with the view that you know, the failures of corporate governance contribute to the financial and economic crisis in Ireland and elsewhere. Because there's, as David Begg says, a dislocation in that, you know, it's, it's corporate governance that is the problem, not the people who were charged with responsibility in that area. And it's very much like the, and I know now I might be, for instance, like the guest at the party, you know, arguing about the invitation at the door before I come in. But just before I'm thrown out, uh, I just want to say that I, I, my view is that the debate about corporate governance has, is, is dislocated from the reality of the people who are involved in the process. And it's almost like the politician who is caught with their finger in the tail say, they're all at it, you know. So suddenly that... You know, does, that, that, that explains it, so it's okay. So, uh, it's almost like, you know, the, the, the car that's crashed, but has nothing to do with the driver who was in it. So, I, I would like to, if you like, bring the debate back to how people should act. And I'm very much uh, attracted to the idea about principles and, 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 and issues that, and, uh, that my colleague has raised here. So, I think there's two problems. There is the system of appointment to boards of companies, and there is the people uh, who are appointed. And there have been failures of people on boards of strategic companies in Ireland. And the makeup of the boards has also been a problem. Now, just on corporate governance, there have been six reports on corporate governance. And so as to uh, convinced myself that this all happened, I brought the book, which is a practical guide to corporate governance, which I bought to uh, educate myself some time ago. And I, for my sins, leafed through the Cadbury, Greenbury, Hempel, Turnbull, Higgs and Smith. Now, there's also two combined codes on top of that to explain to people what good corporate governance is and what they should and shouldn't do. And this very helpful book here even gives us examples of letters to write and how to word them up. So, I take the view that there's enough advice on corporate governance around. And it is now the application of corporate governance standards and acting ethically and morally right that is required. There's also, for instance, you know, a, a, a common law responsibilities. And there's two in particular, fiduciary duty, to act with loyalty, good stewardship, and self-denial. Now, that's the law. Um, the second one I want to make reference to is duty to avoid a conflict of interest. The personal interest of the director must never be in conflict with the interests of those of the company. Now, with 
six reports, two combined reports, and common law. At what stage do the people who sit on boards get the message that there's a right and a wrong way to act? So, with respect, I think we have enough of advice on corporate governance. And we probably have enough of law. We now want practitioners who will act in the best interests of the organisations that they sit on the boards of, and in particular, the wider society. Like, does anybody, for instance, think that if, and I'm sure some people have gone into this in some detail, that the advice, if it was followed in all these corporate government standards in the law, if that was followed, that we'd be in this place we are now. If the people who managed at corporate level, the banks, who have brought us to the stage we're at, if they had followed any of this, would we be in the place we're now? I don't think so. So, I kind of want to call it as it is. People in powerful positions did wrong. And in my humble opinion, they did wrong knowingly. Now, there's a question now of whether they are to be pursued for that wrongdoing or not. And, you know, we might have our arguments about the way they organise their business in America. But they weren't long about uh, chasing Mr. Madoff and taking him to uh, a place of detention for the rest of his life because of his wrongdoing. Now, I'm not sure if that would happen here, and I'm not sure if I want it to happen. Maybe revenge is uh, 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 my, my motivation. But at least the people on the ground who have been destroyed by this have to see at some stage somebody answer. So I think that the people who created this problem at board level did out of a sense of narrow self-interest. They weren't motivated by any ethical or moral standards. I mean, everybody knows, even I. And by the way, let me, let, let me just give you a little bit of background. I left school when I was 16, and I joined the post office delivering telegrams, and I've never been back near a school except delivering mail since. So I have no expert except my experience. But I think I now know right from wrong. And I think that... I would like to think that I have a, a societal, that I have a wider interest in the work I do in a post, uh, in, 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 in a community of people who are served by that company and exist so in some instances the people who, who, who are employed by it. So I have a responsibility uh, there and I think I know right from wrong. And if I don't, I get lots of advice on how to do it from, from the, 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 uh, the, the reading material that is there. But I would suggest that the two issues that are the problem are the makeup of boards of strategic or industries of particular strategic interest to the state and the people who are appointed. And I would like to see, in fact I am suggesting that what we do is that we we put on boards representatives of stakeholders. I don't see any reason. If you just take an example of Bailings Bank, which you're more familiar uh, Damien, than I am with this. But Nick Bearing, uh, Nick Gleason was sending back reports of fantastic returns to a group of people at head office who didn't know what he was talking about or doing, and you refer to this. But they were the people sitting in judgment on these things. Now, if somebody from the front counter of some part of Bearings Bank was sitting on the board, they might just have twigged, God, I wonder if Zim returns really. Maybe we should look at them again. So, I believe that there should be worker directors appointed or elected from the workforce who know the business and would be able to look at the figures and say, oh, that doesn't tally now with what I'm hearing from the public at the front counter or whatever. And also, there should be representatives of the customers, the stakeholders. People who 
uh, give their business to banks have opinions. Uh, they're consumers. They have a view of the world which shouldn't be excluded. And one of the problems is that those boards, in my opinion, has been set up of people, all come from the one background. Many play golf in the same golf club, go to the same dinner parties, share the same interests. So there really isn't any debate among them about what is right and wrong. Um, you know, the figures are good, so don't really shame, let's carry on. So I think as well as that thing, when people are appointed to these boards of strategic industries, they should sign up to a code of ethics. They should act ethically and morally. And they should sign up to doing that. When I joined the board of UNPUST, when I was elected to work director in 1992, I was brought into the chief executive's office and he ran me through the figures for the last number of years. And it was welcome aboard and away you go. And I had to work my way through trying to understand these things. But I didn't have to sign up to anything. I didn't have to give a commitment to the nation's postal service that I would act in its best interests. I didn't have to uh, even uh, tip my hat in the direction of the people that elected me and say, I will in the discussions or in the uh, uh, consideration of the board, I will also factor in the interests of the workers. I didn't have to do anything. I was there, I was in power, and I could do what I wanted. Now, I'm not sure if that degree of accountability is good for a society and good for business. And if you take just my narrow example of the postal service, it has a responsibility to provide a service to the nation every day. It has uh, obligations. I regard myself uh, 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 as being responsible for helping to ensure that happens. To ensure that its practices and its employment uh, uh, responsibilities are carried out. And that it does its job as best it can for the nation. And that I am a servant while I'm on the board of the nation and a guardian of the nation's postal service. Now, I think it's not unreasonable to ask people on the boards of banks which have now been seen to be so important to the nation, that they should also be armed with the same degree of responsibility and moral responsibility and, 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 and ethical values. So, ethical behaviour and moral responsibility, in my opinion, is the, and values and principles which Damien talked about, are the key ingredients to us, if you like, on our journey as we plot the future of our country. And I believe, in simple terms, that we haven't demanded of the people who run our major industries and and, and, and industry, we haven't demanded of them, a, them and we haven't placed upon them the moral responsibility to do right. Instead, we're arguing, maybe, about how we might regulate them, control them, give them corporate governance rules to follow. I think we should ask them to sign a pact for the nation, that they will serve it well, diligently, honestly and ethically. I think a lot of our problems in the past would have been avoided if our major institutions were, uh, uh, and, and our, our boards were filled with people who had that responsibility. And maybe now, given the crisis we're in, that old-fashioned ideas, uh, like values and principles that Damien talked about, should now come back into, into uh, fashion, and we should perhaps start afresh. And I think if we do that, I think we have a better chance of having the, institute, the important institutions of the state answer to the people of the state. Okay, thanks a, a million, Pat. Uh, that's the worker director's view, a very practical view. Um, and, and some very good suggestions. And with impeccable timing, uh, Ray has arrived. You probably all know uh, Professor Ray Kinsler from the Smurfett Business School. You've seen him uh, on, on the media and writing uh, quite passionately about uh, uh, governance and economic and financial affairs. So over to you, Ray. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. I do have um, um, a PowerPoint and uh, somewhere or other there. But just while that's been got up, um, could I just say a couple of things? First of all, 
thanks for the invitation, Paul. And secondly, my apologies for being a little bit totally outside the room. I uh, spoke to anything about. Last year, um, I published a book called Regulation, Corporate Governance and Ethics. And it fits very well into what you are talking about. <coughs> the disaster that occurred, I'm uncomfortable speaking on people, I'm so sorry. The, re the disaster that occurred and that is still rolling forward occurred within the most prescriptive regulatory system we've known. So regulation was necessary, but it wasn't sufficient. There were clear gaps in the regulatory structure in Ireland, but even in the States, where they had a very prescriptive regulatory system, it wasn't enough. And equally, if you look at corporate governance, uh, it's a relatively new uh, area. But if you want the finest statement of corporate governance, read Enron's. And that's not a smart house remark. Read Enron's. And in fact, if it might be so, uh, Paul, I'm glad to be here, but it might be so presumptuous to say, occasionally you come across a wise book. And there's a book uh, published by a guy called Salter, Malcolm, S-A-L-T-E-R, uh, 2008, and it's called Enron, uh, Innovation Corrupted. And it takes a very interesting perspective, perspective towards it. You know, Enron isn't about, or rather, ethics isn't about um, always getting it right. It's about screwing up, God knows I know, but at least there's an objective benchmark there against which you can evaluate where you've gone wrong and how you get back on your feet. What Enron Innovation Corrupted shows is that once a company loses direction, once it loses the moral compass, it goes really into a wasteland and everything is relative. And the measure of the person is the wealth, the prestige, and particularly the power. Now, I've got a big thing about power because I would always say to my students, don't judge, don't look for power. But if power comes your way, you're back again from us. It's a trusteeship that's handed into your hand. It's a trustee, you're a trustee. And it's not about power, it really is about service. It's about service. So, regulation, <coughs> it hasn't been enough to prevent this catastrophe happening or morphing into a wider crisis. Corporate governance, it's become something of an industry, and I have a few suggestions, questions, because I don't presume to give answers. But look at Enron, innovation corrupt, and you see where I'm coming from. And then you, you end up with ethics. And I was just making a note of the points you are making, and maybe you'd like to come back to them. Um, moral responsibility, doing right, ethics. Now, the question is, what's a benchmark? What's the bad, what is right for you? What's right for all of us in the room? What is morally right? I think we've lost, and I just suggest this to you, whatever you're coming from, whether it's a theistic faith or whether you're in a different place, we have lost an essential reference point. And in the case of Enron, it was replaced by short-term shareholder value. In the governance of our society, it's been replaced by power. I talked to a guy recently, and he's a good guy, he called him to see his mother. Um, she hadn't been so well, and uh, this guy is a political student and a uh, very political activist. And he talked in terms of getting back power. I thought, how sad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the guy just has missed the plot. Mm -hmm. Getting back power. Um, somebody once described uh, ethics as obedience to the unenforceable. Now the difference between today and the time you're talking about is that when you walked into the board and you talked about morality, and you talked about right, you talked about ethics, people knew exactly where you were coming from. And they knew that it, the kind of ethical system that we live behind our hall door should be the kind of ethical system that we live behind our office door. But there has been a philosophical divide and that goes back, the roots of this crisis go way back. It's a philosophical system. 
so that the way people we try, we try, we try to live behind our hall door and our families has been very different to the way we live behind or have been constrained to live behind our office door. And therein lies the problem. The kind of imperatives that are that drive people. The imperatives that drive politics and the imperatives that drive companies. Uh, they're not service. The power, the short term shareholder value, the next month's uh, targets, the quarterly targets, all that kind of nonsense. And you get better down there and you just can't get out of that space. And that's where I think we are at the moment. That's where we are at the moment. No, sorry. It, it was, um, uh, uh, can you know, I don't oh, yes. I'm sure I hope it can. People think the central bank the regulator. It's much more complex than that. We start with the central bank and commission and the regulator. And then we go to the director of corporate enforcement. And then we go to the competition authority. And then we go to the criminal assets bureau. Now, the domestic banking sector is here. The overseas banking sector is here. We have responsibility for financial stability. But the board ultimately has responsibility for risk and for getting things right in the interests of all of the stakeholders. So, it's a complicated kind of map and you can't look at it by yourself. Now, look at the kind of change pressures that are, that are coming at us. And probably, if I think back the years, it wasn't like that. But this is the kind of population we're, we're in at the middle. We have representative bodies. We have rating agencies. God knows we have rating agencies. We have the media, who I think perform a very constructive role, institutional investors, the capital markets out there, Department of Finance. We are looking at a seriously complicated topography. Okay? And we have statutory regulation, non-statutory, industry codes and practice, best practice, corporate governance, and then in here, obedience to the unenforced. Now that tells us something, that it's not something you can legislate for. It's not something you can prescribe. You can't tell your kids, be ethical. It's something they learn by example. Wouldn't you agree? It's something they, yeah. they pick up. So, this is, you might think, this is what they call the jargon. I didn't do this. One of my kids, my well, son's done it. He was much bigger, much better than I am at doing it. But I, I drew it out for him. And I know it's very busy. But again, very quickly, let's look at corporate governance in the round. Now, this is what's going down at the moment, guys. Globally, the OECD, that's where they, they're the experts in corporate governance, primarily. They are the experts. The G20 have played a very big role in the last two years, particularly on things that would exercise us here, like remuneration and excess pay and 120 billion, whatever, a million from walking away. The G20 are very serious about this. 
they've set up a financial stability board to look at that part of corporate governance that has to do with remuneration. The BIS, God bless them, have brought in a corporate governance code for banks. And it makes an awful lot of sense. And it's very clear and it's very lucid. But then again, in 2006, they brought in core principles for banking. Read it and weep. Where did we get it wrong? Read it and weep. That was in 2006. And it went through the same consultation process. So that's bearing down in this year. Then we have developments of company law coming in. We have standard setting and issues around accounting and auditing. And accountants, colleagues and friends of mine, who are very good guys, would say, at least to some extent, we were failed. But they should know a lot about corporate governance. Now, coming up here, OK, let's, we have the public good here. I mean, the Central Banking Commission. The Central Bank today would make no bones about saying, oh, so you're, requiring, you're uh, recruiting board members. We want to talk to you. And they will, you will not be appointed unless they're clear that you're a fit and proper person, you have the expertise and all the rest of it. They are intervening directly in corporate governance. The question is, will it be enough? And over here we have a set of stakeholders. Um, two or three I'd like to pick out. Um, customers and staff. It's not popular to say but there are many, many ethical, highly professional people in banking. And they spoke out against what was happening, but they weren't listened to. And one of the big failures of corporate governance is that they listen to everybody, the models, the boards. They listen to everybody, really, but their own people. Now, that must be a big fault in corporate governance, part, where they will listen to everybody, except what the managers and the deputy managers are saying. And I remember say, some of them saying it to me. And I remember people coming to me after a conference and saying, yeah, that's right. Uh, so there has to be some way of listening to staff and respecting the views of experience. Anyway, um, one of the problems about corporate governance is that it focuses really on one set of stakeholders, not the public who bail us out, not management, but shareholders. It's the people who are really important are, can be summarized as the public good. The public good, the, the person, respect for the person. Anyway, here's the important point that I'm talking about. I'm taking up your point again. We need an ethical, values-based business model. Enron was only one of a number that completely lost the plot. Now, you have lots of layers, you have codes of corporate governance, you have new courts coming in in the UK, stewardship, as well as Cadbury, the combined code, the stock exchange, all the rest of it. The whole friggin' thing isn't working, and it's morphing into bigger and bigger structures and more prescriptive things day by day. Somehow or other, it's not working. Ray, you're up your five minutes. I'm so sorry. So you're going yeah. to wrap up. I am. Yeah. Just, just so we can up. get the... Sure. Back to the... the Here's the questions I want to ask you. Has corporate government failed? I think it probably has. Question then, why is it failed? Is it the burden of expectation and corporate governance is too great? Or is the primacy of the shareholder interest flawed? I think it is. If you start from the system of corporate governance, high level controls boards and you say you give them a job to do the right thing if they're only focusing or primarily focusing on the interests of the shareholder then how can it work so that's an important question is it one of implementation i don't think so what's the benchmark against which systems of corporate governance should be measured the public good at the heart of which is the person the family the community that's the objective values based system and how can we avoid a plethora of fragmentation uh, of systems. How can we avoid it? So the two big, the three points. One, corporate governance must be seen in the context of an awful lot of regulation. It hasn't worked. In an awful lot of corporate governance codes and systems that haven't worked. And now we're getting into the area of serious fragmentation. Maybe the model is wrong. Maybe we should be focused on not just the shareholders' interests, but a much wider field. And at a time when our kids have underwritten the banking system for the next generation at least, 
maybe we should be thinking about the public good and crafting corporate governance around that. Many thanks for your indulgence. Okay, thanks very much, Ray. Um, well, you've had three very good contributions there, and as I said, now they focused, uh, well, the, the latter two more on uh, company law and local stuff uh, in Ireland. But I said corporate governance goes, well, that's not quite true, of course, Ray pointed out that the B Bank of International Settlements and OECD and all the G20 people are looking at trying to uh, bring in rules uh, at international level. But uh, it's over to you, and you can speak about anything you wish. Okay. Yeah, I had a couple of questions for Daniel. Um, I'll take about four questions and then come back to you, get the, these guys to answer. And each of the other speakers too. Um, insofar as you're familiar with it, would you say the culture in in Ireland among those entities which where corporate governance is an issue is one of recognizing corporate governance and following it or just finding a way around it? In other words, is there any sense of compliance as a general is the culture one of compliance? Um, it, for Pat, um, just this is a slight side issue away from corporate governments, if we're talking about the three billion, that's, um, I think that's, that's frequently mentioned. Would you see a role for the state in maybe taking that away from the NTMA and using it for uh, lending to the, the, the SME sector, the digital sector in Ireland? Um, you said that you weren't so much, you didn't think there was so much the structure of corporate governments that was the fault of the people who were involved in, in our, say, our banking system, etc. But do you think an improved corporate governments, either in formulation or in implementation, has a role in curbing the ambitions of those people. Um, sorry, uh, you're talking about pursuing the wrong doors, is there a role for that? I, um, <clears throat> what comes to mind is that certainly in promoting a culture of compliance, if people see that those worst offenders are not getting away with it, I think that would, would be a one factor in that. Um, and the power groups, you, 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 you refer to the power groups. I think one of the problems was that for somehow we developed a system, especially in banking, where a small group of people could kind of almost put themselves into power, could pay themselves what they wanted and more do what they liked. And I think any corporate government system, which going on what Ray was saying, it's already happening, must, must you know, break up that cartel, that kind of, that's crony capitalism groups that okay. I refer to. Um, Can I, I um, hold you because yeah. I have quite a few more questions. The very back. Um. Yeah, we live in a society where if actions are not prescribed by law, they're generally deemed illegal. Therefore, if actions are not prescribed by law and we're depending on morality and ethics, they're not enforceable. Now, that's more or less the point that you were making. So that's a choice we have to make. Now, the other thing that Pat Compton said about revenge I don't think people really want to see revenge. What they want to see is deterrence. If the actions are not deterred and that we don't enforce, and if there is no sanctions on what people do, then there is no deterrence. So people in the future will do the same thing. So I don't think it's about revenge. I think it's about creating in the future that people will not do the same thing. That's an excellent point. Uh, you, and, well, then the, then, and then I'm going to go back to the table here. Yeah, I completely agree with the last speaker. That's what occurred to me. I mean, you can't legislate for ethics, that's right, but we do have law on the subject already. We do have the fiduciary duties of directors that Pat Compton was talking about, and we do have conflicts of interest duties on them as well. So what strikes me is that we're very, very short on enforcement. We really do need an augmentation of the resources available to the Director for Corporate Enforcement, Paul, Apple, Paul Appleby, and Jim Hamilton, the DPP. And we need people in there with specialised knowledge who, you, you know, if, if a tenth of the lawyers going into um, the big five law firms with commercial law knowledge put that at the service of the state, we'd be a lot, better, a lot quicker at enforcing the way they are in the states. And I think that's very important because, as the last speaker said, it's not revenge. But one reason why people are so angry and upset at the inequity of what's going on at the moment is because of the perception that there is no justice for, for white collar crime. And just on that as well, I think we do need more political accountability than just elections too, by the way. They don't come along fast enough. 
So some people feel that the prosecution of, for instance, the Icelandic Prime Minister is maybe going a bit too far. But it's the politicians who agreed to that. It's actually the, it's the committee in their parliament which bowed to the view of the people that there should be a measuring up of very serious economic wrongdoing by ministers. And if our legislation isn't good enough, we need bigger, better legislation for that too, I think. Okay, uh, this man here, and then I come to you and then we go back to the panel. Um, I suppose a uh, cynic's question is, um, as it regards the size of the Irish population, the pool from which people with man sufficient management and, and uh, academic backgrounds are coming from, do you think there's not inevitably going to be some level of, cre of cronyism, because inevitably there's only going to be a small pool to pick from for a very large number of boards? Um, and uh, I suppose then, uh, similarly, is our political structure is there not necessarily, necessarily going to need to be a massive reform of our political structure before any type of the political accountability that the last speaker spoke about, um, uh, before that can be brought into play? Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, um, I suppose risk is at the core of everything. I just want to commend John. I, I think your story is excellent. I'd love to see it on prime time on television or something, because you did a great job, but you did a great job with high risk. Uh, I think in today's knowledge of what I love corporate governance, you were put into a job of responsibility. You weren't trained. You weren't briefed. You didn't have the skills coming in. So you were like a loose cannon going into a company. And what saved you was you, you, all the ethics and your, your curiosity. You went and you educated yourself. And then you had the two things of uh, ethics and moral responsibility. And that is what has carried you. But you cannot run businesses like that, that's individual, you cannot measure it, or you cannot standardize it. And that's very sad that that type of thing doesn't work. It will work for an individual because of the type of person you are. So I, I really think we do need, we have rules. All the corporate governance is there, with too much of it in fact. And people get confused with this complexity. But I believe you can always get to what's called sim simplicity beyond complexity and get to the elephant in the room. We all had, uh, had uh, corporate governance, but it, it was, was it being enforced, was it being monitored, and had we penalties for non-compliance? I mean, if you just had those four things, heavy penalties, I don't think we'd have had as much of breaking of the corporate governance that we've experienced and which we'll be paying for for many years to come. So yeah, good point. Okay, uh, we'll come back to the floor in a minute so you can be thinking of more questions. I'll ask Ray first to, to respond. Pick what bits and questions you wish to answer. Just don't have to answer them all each. Yeah, um, I must say they're extremely insightful questions. And I, I, four points occur to me. One of them is that the crisis we have in this country, Clinton not home at this point recently, not just a banking crisis to do with corporate governments, it's not just an economic crisis. And by heavens, we have an economic crisis about which there is extraordinary denial. Um, the crisis is multifaceted, it's civic. It's all of those things that arise from a slide into relativism, which you can see in that world. So we can't solve one part of the problem in isolation. The second point is, I think, partly, if you have that kind of renewal of society, then you will be looking at corporate governance as being essentially to do with common sense to do with morality and to do with, you know, doing the right thing in a systematic way. I think the third point is there is a really big implementation gap in Ireland. And Paul, we have so many breaking reports. We are knee deep in reports across every domain of our society and they're not working. So um, I don't know where that leaves us. I'm just, just trying to make the point there that in terms of cor corporate governance alone, never mind regulation, we are inundated with codes of all kinds, and they are not working. Um, enforcement is, I think, extremely important. I think you're right about enforcement. If you have codes there, there has to be enforcement. Um, but I don't think it goes the whole way. I still think there's a space there to do with the sensitivity of right and wrong, the sensitivity to do with a benchmark, which is the public good. A company is not your playground. It's given to you for a few years to hand on in trust to those who are dependent on it. If you don't have respect for the public, 
And if you don't have respect for your staff, and most of all those who you serve, then you're in trouble. And I absolutely believe that the culture of power, which you see in banks and the culture of power in politics, is anathema mm -hmm. to effective governments. It's just wrong. Again. Yeah. On the, the question about, you know, is, is there a culture of finding sort of ways around corporate governance? I'm not an expert on, on Ireland as such, but I would say that, well, yeah. Um, to, to identify that, you would have to say, well, is there a system of enforcement in place? So you, you really can't measure one without the other. And it seems to me that you wouldn't have to try very hard to get around it. It's, it's more the issue then. And, you know, I, I think the other lady in the audience probably answered your question in terms of enforcement. That, you know, it's very hard to say. Um, on the, the, the issue of, well, is, is, the, is the pool of which directors are elected from, drawn from you know, sort of a narrow pond or a small pond? Um, possibly, but that doesn't, ex you know, I don't see any big banks that have made an effort to sort of incorporate diversity on their boards or even to look abroad and, and you know, see if, I mean, I think there's been plenty of banking, ex called banking experts that have come out of the woodwork from all parts of the world over the last couple of years. And, you know, it, it seems that there's been no real effort made to look a bit harder. Hey, can I ask this on a different pool of yeah. the, yeah. the employees? Well, um, just in terms of the list of issues that I've made note and I hope that I've been, that I've been attentive to, to what people have said, just in terms of the culture, can I give you an example? I live in a small community, Strokes on a Contrast Town, and everybody knows everybody else. But I happen to have a friend or an acquaintance who worked in the banking business, not local. But his figures weren't right or whatever. He wasn't given enough, I don't know what the sermon is. But they arrived one day to discuss his figures with him. Now it happened to be two young people, half his age. He had spent his lifetime in the bank. He had worked hard, as people do. And two people, very young guys, arrived to tell him that he wasn't performing well enough. His KPIs, which are key performance indicators in the business, weren't just up on the graph on the good Now, you think about it. This person would be a modest, genuine, decent individual, as most people are. He had worked his life in the bank. He had been fair to everybody. No, he refused a loan if he thought the person wasn't in a position to repay it. He didn't push products on people. He was of the old school. He was no longer required. He was surplus to requirements because his performance just wasn't up there. He wasn't producing. Now, I'm only given that example of that we had lost contact in banking with the values that we thought we had in the standards of our Now, I only give that example because that poor man was distraught with the fact that his employers in the guise of two young people, and not be against young people, they're all faster and fitter than me and uh, hopefully will help me up the stairs and all that in later years. But it was just that the whole way in which he was treated was part of a corporate move towards a different type of society, different type of entity. I'll just give you that example. So, in terms of culture, it was driven from the top by people who had lost their own themselves were answerable to nobody. And every employee, and I speak to some extent as, uh, from that perspective, every employee was a unit cost who must produce so many more units of profit to justify the existence. So the whole question of service and banks and whatever went out the door. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and okay. no, I just give that small example of that, and I hope I'm delayed. In terms of the question about NTMA, that's the state's money. So the NTMA handles money on behalf of the state. The post office is just a, a, an institution. The fact is, a couple of years ago, the NTMA weren't in interested whatsoever in, in state savings. The post office was old fashioned. People still in queues, mainly pensioners. And if they had a little post office book, they put a few bob in it. it was, well, nothing to do with the Celtic Tiger, the way we're moving now. 
Of course, there's no one really known the country. So the Intimate are very interested. And it happily coincides with the fact that people don't trust the banks, and they're all moving their money out of the banks and putting it into post offices into little green books and various other services. But it is for the government to decide what to do with it. The post office is just an agent. And I suspect at the moment that the NTMA, by the way, the NTMA, I suspect, have come out of this better than most institutions in the state. They do appear to have come out of it better than they have got it right. Uh, and they, handle, they, they do, uh, do very important work raising money for the state and all that kind of I know no more about them except just to look at them from the outside and they seem to be, uh, you know, I, I come out with some degree of credit. Um, do we need an improved code? I suppose because of the fact that I, I didn't, if you like, pursue for, for very peculiar reasons. I had to go to work when I was 16, wasn't I? I didn't pursue education to any great extent beyond that. So do I need to read another code? I'd rather not. But I'm not saying if we got the right code, I promise you I'd read it. <laughs> the unfortunate thing is I've had to go through Higgs and Turnbull and Cadbury and all that kind of stuff to bring this up to you. And I've come to the conclusion that it's all very well and good, but in the end of the day I could still do wrong if I really wanted it, which comes back to the point, you know, can you legislate for anything? Uh, so maybe we do need a, I, I'm not enough of an expert to know do we need it, uh, and I don't know what code I want. Okay. But just on, on the, on the pursuit of door, sorry. I, I'm not, I only mentioned that, I was thinking to myself, is it revenge? Do I want revenge? I was referring to myself when I want people pursued. But you put it better. Yes, I should, it determined. It determined, exactly. Yeah, it comes across the media a lot too, they're all talking about people want vengeance. Exactly. Whereas I'm saying, no, we don't. We I, don't I think, and I, I, maybe I want to determine rather than vengeance. I was speaking about what's in my own mind. And finally, the size of the pool. In my opinion, the pool is big enough. Yes. I, I think we, I'm not sure if we need everybody with certain academic qualifications and boards. We need diversity, we need representatives, various people. And some of the smartest people that I've come across in business, and, and I know it's a narrow uh, experience, have been the people on the ground who could tell you how the business works a lot better than the chief financial officer. Because they work with the customers, and work with the people, and deliver the products. And sometimes, if the chief financial officer went down to the shop floor and listened to those people, it was easily on a database. Uh, and what they're paid and how long they are they're there and what, what other companies they're on it's what their expertise is I mean in this day and age in ter terms of technology that should be easily accessible to us all and it's just not there so despite all the reports there's an incredible level of opacity and I think that's 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 still a problem right that's one oh I might go oh, I, had, I had another one but anyway all right I should go ahead diversity on boards. I think um, Regling and Watson, when they came over for the Finance Committee, one of their points that they made and um, added was about bringing in international experts, even the Finance Committee and government, but maybe perhaps looking at boards as well, or what's your thoughts on it? Okay, and the last contribution. Two, two, two points to me. One is that a colleague who, in a previous job, which is the civil servant in the Department of the Environment, had responsibility for managing the process by which the board of the nuclear something or boards that looks after the nuclear bits that are around the country. And she used to said that one of the problems she had was that there, it's not a commercial activity. The board of it, the members of it, were appointed, you know, there was representatives of radiologists, representatives of the universities, and so forth, and representatives of the workers. And she said one of the nightmares was when you had stakeholder uh, involvement like that, was that the, the members of the board saw themselves as representing their sector and only that, and had no interest in the finances are bit haywire, that's not my problem, I'm here to make sure that the, the medical radiologists' interests are protected when they make a decision. That's a challenge, I think. The second point I want to make is it's a, to do with the terms of reference for the session and all, and all that. But it strikes me that there is a deeper question about what is the role of, of, of corporate governance. Um, we've set up, up today's discussion in terms of how it contributed to a cause led to a crisis. But once we get out of that, what is the role of corporate governments in, in driving equality in, in, in economic outcomes, for instance, in companies and so forth? And that's something that will be, I think, important to look at, not now, obviously, but at a future task on this. Okay, I'm not going to go back to the panel. Are we that pushed for time, or can I go back to the panel? You can have a quick go back to the panel. See, okay. everybody else is in the coffee. Just, now. Just, we might have to okay. Just, coffee. Um, 
So I'll go this side, Pat, mm -hmm. first, and be short. Well, very, well, very quickly, there is a risk of having stakeholders on board that they will fall into the trap of representing sectional interests. Yeah. I've had to stand before groups of workers whose jobs were disappearing. I was responsible for that as a member of the board. You have to, you have to do things in the best interest of the wider societal group. And I can tell you something, it is a challenge. There's no doubt about that, and you've got to be strong. And if you go on board and represent the sectional interest, then all you're doing is you're just a mouthpiece for one particular group. And I don't think you can do that. In terms of the, the no information, uh, I suppose you're right. Uh, you know, but, but let me give an example. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know what information is out there on people like me. Maybe there's too, too much or maybe not enough, or maybe there shouldn't be. But all I, I can say is that it's important that boards function with a wider a, a remit and a wider responsibility than narrow sectional interest or shareholder value. And just one example, Nordia Bank in, in uh, Finland and Norway, whatever, they happen to have worker directors on their boards. It's very interesting to look at Nordia Bank's accounts on the internet. I'm not saying worker directors, okay. period, that, but Over the board the structure helped. He's going to pass, Ray, three points. <laughs> on a board, on a board, you need expertise, you need independence, you need access, and you also need a dissonant voice. People who are prepared to stand up and say no. Secondly, I think we need to look at professional responsibility as well as accountability. Of course, we need accountability, and there should be more information. But I think we have crowded out responsibility. If you're there, you should have the to be able to take responsibility and not seek to cover your ass by seem to say accountability. Finally, I think that in taking this forward, the centre of gravity of corporate governance needs to shift. It needs to shift away toward the public good. Excellent. What should be should have been a very dry subject, <coughs> certainly far from dry, and um, I want to thank you all for, for excellent uh, contributions. Um, just uh, one thing on sanctions, I can't resist this, because I just saw the answer to a parliamentary question this week. One of the tenure, oh, he was ten years as a director of the AIB, and you know what they did, um, and he's just been appointed as an advisor at 150,000 for three years to the Department of Finance. So you can see the kind of sanctions that this government is imposing on bank directors. And most of the rest of them are still running the companies, that are ruining the companies. But um, I really commend that you read the Mapping the Golden Circle by task. I think it's a superb document on this subject. Actually, we were, we, I think it's been so good. We actually brought enough copies so that people actually can There's take one for everyone in the audience. In the traditional <laughs> way, please thank the panel. <laughs>